Well, good morning. Okay, y'all are awake. Good. I'm lead Pastor Bar Let's go to welcome you this Palm Sunday as we conclude our More Than a Building series. Well, again, welcome Ballet Folkloro de Los Angeles. How many times have I mangled that? So honored to have you guys with us today on this Palm Sunday. Uh, they performed at the Welder Center last night. Let me tell you guys, uh, Scott didn't, I don't think, praise them enough. I've gone to Disney World for years and years and years, and in the Disney World and Epcot, there's a thing called the World Showcase, where they bring cultures and, and, and acrobats, and every, every pavilion is a different country, and they have people from that country, performers or stuff like that. What I saw last night on the stage at the Welder Center was better than anything I had seen at Walt Disney World in the Mexican Pavilion there. They are incredible. They are incredible. They do this machete dance. And I walked out there and they came out and they're doing it all. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if those are real machetes. And about that time they clank them and sparks fly. And I'm like, ooh, those are real. Somebody's going to lose a hand. Me and, Skip, me and Skip are going to do a machete dance, and then we figured no arm flying in the, in the audience is not a good thing. So anyway, they're going to be performing out on the patio, under the awning, after the service. Uh, we've got food vendors with hot dogs. you got to do baptisms. You need to be baptized. Come see us afterwards. going to be a great afternoon after the service this Palm Sunday. You don't want to miss it. Well, four weeks now, four weeks we've been doing this series called More Than a Building. And this has basically been a stewardship series. Talking about stewardship four messages on stewardship, about four hours of teaching. And I think we've probably spent 10 to 15 minutes total. We presented the budget and stuff, talking actually about money and finances and that stuff. Uh, and that includes last week when Pastor Scott talked about the, the friends of the paraplegic lowering him down to meet Jesus in the house and asking, who's going to pay for the roof? So it's been one of those series. So today we're going to conclude it. This is Commitment Sunday. Now we've passed out... <laughs> To start, we passed out these cards, budget, had a chance for you to make your commitment, your commitment to Fellowship of the Crossroads. At the end of the story, if you didn't get one of these, everybody got one of these, every household got one of these. If you didn't raise your hand, Clayton will bring you one. At the end of the service, we're going to take time and an act of worship, and we're going to present these at the cross. It's going to be really moving and powerful. So be thinking about that, what your commitment to God is and commitment to Fellowship of the Crossroads is over this coming year. And some of you may be still trying to figure that out. As you're trying to figure that out, let me ask you this question. Let me help by ask you this question. What's this church worth to you? What is this church, this congregation, this body worth to you? I think it's fitting we do this on Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, made his first step for that commitment to go to the cross in our place. So at the end, we're going to give you a chance to turn in your commitment cards. Between now and then, I'm going to share part of my story, a story that, that few of you have, have heard. I'm going to challenge you like I always challenge you. And we're going to have some fun today, too, something to show how different this church is. When you walked in, you were handing one of these envelopes. You were told not to open it. Don't open it yet. I'll give you some instructions here during the service, but we're going to play a, a little game here in a minute. I'm going to have some fun with it. It's going to be chaos in here, I'm telling you right now, but we're going to have some fun. So let me pray and we'll get moving. Father, thank you again for this day and this morning, this opportunity we have to gather together, to open your word, to look at it, to study it, to hear it, opportunity to gather together for fellowship and community and to praise and to worship you. And we thank you for this day, especially this as we start this holy week moving toward the most precious and special day of the year where we celebrate what you did on the cross for us. And so we thank you for this day and this opportunity we have in your son's name. Amen. Also, if you didn't get a, one of these envelopes either, you need to let the, raise your hand, let the ushers know they will bring you one. But like I said, on Sundays, most Sundays, about the only time we talk about finances and stuff is when we put up the, uh, you know, the budget, what's going on, what the giving is up on the board when we do, uh, when we do giving. When we take up an offering. That's about the only time we do it. And that's because I honestly, I don't like talking about money. As a pastor, it's weird. I'm not comfortable really talking about money. Now, I love money. I love, well, okay, that came out wrong. 
I actually do like talking about money. I love helping people. I love helping people to work out debt. I love helping people to start investing. I love helping people to make a budget and make plans for the future because money is a tool. It's used, it can be used for good or it can be used for evil. And the Bible, here's the thing. The Bible talks about money and giving more than most other things. You know what it talks about money and giving more than salvation? Do you know that? Because salvation, God didn't think we'd have much of a problem with that. But God knew that giving, giving of ourselves because of our selfish sin nature was going to be difficult for us. It was going to be a major problem. And God knew that we would idolize our finances and our bank accounts, that we would put our safety and our trust in that more than Him. And we turn that into an idol. So He addresses that a lot in Scripture. Finances are an area we all struggle with. And I get it. I get it. Some of you know my story. I grew up a poor teacher's kid. I mean, poor teacher's kid. I didn't know that you could get hot dog buns in the store. I thought you only got hot dogs with the buns at like ball games. Because in my house, when we had hot dogs, we wrapped them in white bread. In fact, most of the time, so how many of you grew up doing that? You know, if, yeah, there you go. Okay. Most days when we had tacos, we didn't have taco shells. We had what we called, my mom called the Mexican sandwiches. She'd make the taco meat, and you'd take a piece of your, your craft American cheese and tear it into strips and put it on it, and you put in a flour tortilla because taco shells came in boxes of 12, but for the same amount of money, you could get a bundle of 50 flour tortillas, and it would last longer. That's how I grew up. I grew up that poor teacher's kid. You know, I knew when the end of the month was because we didn't do anything. We didn't go anywhere. Hey, we're out of milk. Yeah, you got four days. We, that, that, that's how I grew up. I get that, which made me be a worker and a saver. I grew up saving. In elementary school, me and Skip would mow yards in our neighborhood. I mean, we were in elementary school. We were mowing yards for, you know, five, seven bucks and splitting it and thinking we were rich. In sixth grade, I started working at our pool in our neighborhood. If you've ever been to the Shenandoah neighborhood, I, I worked at that pool from the time I was in sixth grade until I graduated high school every summer, and I put money away, and I saved. I joke, I was doing Dave Ramsey before Dave Ramsey was doing Dave Ramsey. I do budgets. I, I'd save money. When me and Molly got married, same thing, we got married, my grandmother and my great aunt I mean, I had our first apartment, you know, we we're going to get married, we we're going to move in there a couple of weeks, and that apartment consisted of a TV stand with my TV on it and two lawn chairs. And my grandmother and my great aunt surprised us, they went to Lax, and they went into Lax, and apparently they said, what is the ugliest furniture you have? <laughs> we're getting that. I mean, this was a couch that you would not find, most grandmothers would go, yeah, that's ugly. So we had a couch and a love seat and an end table and a dining room table. We had that furniture for 15 years before we replaced a single piece of it because we were saving money. That's, that's how I am. We, we, it was 18 years before we bought our first new car that we saved up cash and paid for. Now we drive cars till the wheel falls off and we put the payment aside each month so by that one finally breaks, we have enough money to go pay cash for another one. I'm cheap, y'all. I don't know if you figured that out. Okay? Well, here's the thing, and Dave Ramsey said this, and I, I mean, we've been living like this for almost 18, 19 years when I found Dave Ramsey, and Dave Ramsey said this. He said, if you live like no one else, later you can live and give like no one else. And me and Molly realized that's what we had been doing for years. We worked hard, and we followed God's biblical principles for saving and for giving and, and, and stayed out of debt, and we've been blessed beyond our wildest dreams. We've been blessed beyond our wildest dreams. And growing up as a kid, I didn't go to church, and I'll tell you why in a second. But I would see TV pastors, or a friend of mine might invite me to church, and the pastor would start talking about money and trying to guilt, felt, felt like he was trying to guilt me into giving. And it ticked me off. Hated it. And I had this attitude. And it wasn't until I, I figured out let me tell you my parents' story. My parents grew up in Kennedy, Texas. Went to First United Methodist Church in Kennedy, Texas. That's where they grew up. That's where they're married in. And, and went there, high school, a little bit of college. They graduated, got married, went off to college. Dad, went, Dad and mom went off to Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches, Texas. Lumberjack. And while they were there, 
had been in school first semester during the fall, and in the spring, about the start of the spring semester, they got a letter from the First United Methodist Church of Kennedy, Texas, telling them that they were six months behind in their tithes, and if they did not make it up immediately, their name would be stricken from the role of the church, and they would no longer be considered members. And my dad got mad. This pastor was a friend of his. He had married him and my mom. This, he felt, felt betrayed. So when they were off at, at spring break, Easter spring break, went back and asked the pastor, hey, I got this letter. And he goes, man, Ralph, I'm so sorry. You shouldn't have got that. And he goes, oh, somebody sent these out that shouldn't have. Somebody just does. He goes, oh, no. Oh, no. Everybody that was behind got those letters. We could, we've thrown a bunch of people out of the church. But you guys are off at college, so, so, so you can make it up when you get back. And my dad said, and I'll be honest, he said, hell no. If all you want is my money, you can't have me. I didn't grow up in the church. That drove my parents out of the church. I didn't go to church except for the friend now and then until I was 17 years old when I met this cute little blonde who I've been married to now for almost 31 years. Holy Spirit in a skirt, baby. It's awesome. <laughs> but then I started going to church, and that's when I found Jesus, and I gave my life to him. And then I got called into the ministry. And man, I realized when, when I got called into the ministry that I was going to be in trouble because I stink at asking people for money. I don't do it. I could never be a missionary and raise my own support because I grew up in a family that was basically, you need something, you work your butt off, you save your money, and then you do what you need to do. That's how I grew up, okay? So y'all need to know from the start 12 years ago when we started this church, when God called me to start this church, I didn't start this church because I needed a paycheck. I didn't start this church to make a living. I know some guys that do that drive me nuts. I know guys that basically start a church because that's all they know how to do and it becomes their business. I know guys that they go to churches and their wife, their kids, their junior high kids, their elementary school kids are all on the payroll. All get a paycheck. And that's garbage, y'all. That's garbage. I didn't start this church to make a living. In fact, at the end of 2009, I'd given up. I'd stepped down from a church. I spent a year trying to see where God was going to take me. Nothing was clicking. I never saw myself as a senior pastor or a founding pastor. I just want to be a small groups guy, just serve. In 2009, man, I hit a wall, and I was pretty much done. My grandmother passed away in 2006. Uh... And right after that, my dad, my brother, and I, we inherited the family ranch. It had been in the family for over 150 years. And the way it always worked, the patriarch ran it. And when they died, it got handed to the next generation, and they took it over. And dad brought my brother and me in and said, hey, let's, let's start running this thing. So we did cattle, we did hay, we did leasing. And I started making double per year, more than double per year, what I'd ever made being a pastor. So I didn't have to work. I didn't have to do it. I thought, oh, I'm just going to help my brother. I'm going to follow behind him on the tractor. I'll do the hay rake. I'll, I'll help him ban cattle and worm and all that stuff. And, you know, I'll find me a little PR job in town and MC some events and do some things. And God went, uh-uh. And I've told you that story. I, I went to go do a job interview just to, at the college just to do some PR stuff. And I kept, every time I walked to the truck, I'd feel sick. I'd run back in the house. And after about the third time, I let my keys on the counter and started walking out. Stood in that same spot where three times before I'd felt sick. And a voice, not an audible voice, the clouds did not open. God didn't go, Bard, I'm talking to you. <laughs> but in the back of my head, I heard it. And it wasn't my voice. And it said, I did not create you to sit behind a desk. I did not create you to sit on a tractor. Go do what I called you to do. And that's when we started this church back in 2010. Called it Renegade. 2017 renamed it fellowship of the crossroads and we did it to be different and many of y'all are here because you know it's different like scott you said you see it's different it's a different attitude a different way of doing things so in the middle of this story i'm gonna switch gears y'all know i love illustrations and y'all today are going to help me with an illustration today we're going to do something a little different we're going to and it's going to be freaking nuts in here y'all y'all get ready we're going to play a little game. It's called the money game. I want each of you, you got this envelope? Take your envelope out. 
do this so that you know so that you know it's a real envelope all right I want you to open the envelope I want you to open the envelope boy it sounds like a wave going on in here all right most of you in this envelope you should have about three dollars some of you are just not as blessed and you might only have gotten two because we miscounted some of you may have four you're a little bit more blessed because we ran out of money at the end of the stack and just shoved four in an envelope but here's the deal this money this is me and molly's money i went to the bank got the weirdest look when i said told the teller i need six hundred dollars in ones <laughs> and she looked at me like where are you going and i'm like And shame on all of you for laughing at that. <laughs> and I went, oh, no, no, it's for a church event. And then she gave me an even weirder look. And I said, you ought to come to our church on Sunday and see. And it's like she took a step back. And I'm like, okay, let me explain. But here's how we play this game. This is the game. Now, you guys are going to have to get up. You're going to have to stand up. You're going to have to spread out a little bit. Here are the rules to the game. You're going to have, and again, this is me and Molly's money. We're giving it to you today. This is the rules of the game. You're going to have five minutes to give away my money. Five minutes to give away my money. And here are the rules. You're going to stand up, okay? Here are the rules. One, you can only give away one dollar at a time. So you walk up to somebody and you hand them a dollar. You give them a dollar. Rule number two, if someone gives you a dollar, you have to take it. You have to take it. But here's rule number three. If someone gives you a dollar, you have to give someone else a dollar before you can give that person a dollar. If someone gives you a dollar, you just can't trade dollars. If somebody gives it to you, you got to take it from them, you got to give it to somebody else before you give that person a dollar. Rule four, you have to wait at least 10 seconds to give someone that dollar, okay? So you can't do this, I'll hand it to you and then hand it to them, okay? Rule five, if you give away all of your money, you have to stop where you're at and raise your hand and wait, and trust me, somebody's going to give you a dollar. And six, if you see somebody just standing there, like the guy that got one talent and just buried it, and standing there hoarding, ignore them, don't give them any dollars. You have five minutes. All right, stand up, y'all. I'm serious. We're going to play this game. You got five, all the lights up. You got five minutes on the clock, so you, and you can't stand in the same spot. Ready, go. Start the timer, Kyle. I'm not playing. Oh crap. I'm going to step back so I don't have to take any money. Come on, go. Uh oh, there you go. Come on. Keep going now. Lose your money. Raise your hand. No, I'm thinking. Five people. You got to move, and you got to move. Even if you if you don't have money, you got to raise your hand and move. Fifty seconds. Fifty seconds. What? Yeah. You got to. There you go. All right. We're in. The, we're down to the home stretch. Down to the home stretch. Here we go. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. What? What? Yeah. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Six, five, four, three, two, one. It's over. All right. Now, there you go. All right, back to your seats. Back to your seats. Anybody watching online right now thinks we're probably nuts, and that's okay. Let me ask you this. How many of you have more than five dollars? How many of you wound up with more than five dollars? How many of you wound up with $10 or more? How many of you wound up with $20 or more? 
Okay, come here. Okay, let me go to the next row. Let's see. We, we, one, two, three, four. We did five. Anybody in the, in the fifth row? Give it. Not, not anything. Wait. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Lori, pick a number. Eight. Five. No. The number was five. All right. One, two, three, four, five. Fifth row. Anybody give away everything? And we have no money. Oh my gosh, everybody has no money. Um, all right. Okay. Somebody just give me, give me a number between one and three. Over here, you see base. Shit, give me a number between one and three. Two. Okay. One. First two that first two that don't have their hand up, come up. First two, yeah. First two that have their hand up, come up, come up. Yeah, come on up, come up, come up, come up, come on. Come up on stage. Come up on stage. Got to, got to come up for Gloria guys here. Y'all give me a hand, y'all. Okay. All right. Now. So you guys gave all your money away. Well, what? Zero, right? All we all are faithful. So you do get 50. You guys go have fun. <laughs> all right, give him a hand, y'all. <laughs> no y'all do whatever, whatever y'all do. Y'all do bike box of the way out. Do what you want to. Again, this is, like I said, this was me and Molly's money, and we gave it to y'all. Now, let me ask you this. Wasn't that fun? Why was that fun? Do what? I'll tell you why it was fun. Because it wasn't your money. It was my money. It was Molly's money. But here's the thing, y'all. I had so much fun watching y'all give it all away. And you say, Bard, how can you part with basically $750 like that and just give it away? I could do that because you know what? It's not my money. It's God's money. Amen. It's God's money. He gave it to me to steward it over for my family and my personal needs, but also to multiply his kingdom. And when I was putting this together a week ago and thought about this, it's like, I'm like, what can I do? And this popped into my head. I've been giddy for like two weeks. Couldn't wait to do this. And I realized I was going to give away 150. Then I thought, no, let's, let's give away three. And then this morning I went, no, we're going to do four. We're going to do four. Because I had no idea. And I even, I, I had, had no idea. I've done this in other groups and things. And it's like usually there's one or two people that, that have managed to give away everything. 
I didn't expect like 30 of you to have done it. I was going to pick one number, you know, and it, it was going to be whatever. But here's the thing, y'all. It wasn't mine to it wasn't mine in the first place. God gave it to me to steward it. And so giving it to y'all was fun. And see, that's what we as Christians so easily forget. We tend to think that everything we have is ours. We tend to think everything we have is ours. We've worked for it. We've earned it. We've, we've, we've slaved for it or whatever. And, and, this is, and this is ours. And we forget that it was God that gave us the talent and the time and the ability. And then he did it. He blessed us with it. As Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As easy as it comes, it could be gone. And we forget everything comes from him. Look at what scripture says, Romans 11.36. says, everything comes from him and exists by his power as it intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Everything comes from him, everything. And the word there, the Greek word for everything is pos. It can also be translated as all. What does all mean? All. Put that verse up again, Kyle. Everything, all, everything comes from him. All is all. Look at Psalm 24, 1. It says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. And the word there for everything is a Hebrew word called melo, melo. And it means the entire content, which means all, all. The earth is the Lord's and all, everything in it in it belongs to him. First Chronicles, the writer of Chronicles puts it this way. He's talking about the nation of Israel and they'd got the harvest together and he says this, but who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you, Lord? Who are we that we could give anything to you? Everything we have comes from you and we give you only what you first gave us. You gave it to us first. I've used this story before. Some of you have heard it. Some of you haven't. About the dad who takes his kid to McDonald's. His dad's kid's really hungry, a little five-year-old. And he buys him a large fry. And he gives him the fry. And his son's just in there eating the fries. Oh, so eating fries. And the dad reaches over to get one fry. And the kid pulls him away and goes, mine. These are mine, dad. Get your own. And the dad thinks, son, you don't understand. I bought you those fries. I can take those fries away at any moment. Or I can buy you so many fries that you will get sick of them and never want to eat another fry in your life. You forget they come from me. We forget everything comes from God. Like the parable of the talents. God gives to us and he trusts us. He trusts us to be good stewards. And as we're good stewards, he gives us more. And see, here's the whole point is this. As God gave to us first, as God gave to us first, he expects us to give to him first. He expects us to give to him first. To give to him first. Let me ask you this. How many of you in a relationship, you have to raise your hand, but how many of you been in a relationship or been in a relationship? I want you to think of a relationship, probably one that didn't work out. Hope it's not one you're in right now. But you're in a relationship with somebody who put everything else before you. Put everything else before you. Everything came first. Man, if you had plans, work, a friend, a phone call, all of a sudden they'd break them. Any, anything, anything could disrupt those plans. Anything could disrupt those plans. Everything came before you. Situation family, they're out the door. Break, break a date, an engagement, whatever it was. Their friends would call with a better offer, and all of a sudden, you know, instead of going out, going to the movie, doing whatever with you, they're out running around with friends. They're going hunting. They're going fishing. They're going for a girls' night. How'd that make you feel? How'd that make you feel? Hurt? Alone? Taken advantage of? Not important? Like you're getting leftovers? Unloved? How do you think God feels when we do that to him? He gives everything to us first, and yet we so often put him last. In Scripture, the concept is called first fruits. Some of you may have heard that. It's called first fruits. Second Chronicles says this. 
writer writes that as soon as the order went out, this is the nation of Israel, the harvest was in, it was, it was, it was you know, fall was coming, everything was in, said the order went out and the Israelites generously gave their first fruits of grain, new wine, oil and honey, and all that the fields had produced, and they brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. A tithe of everything. See, they realized that everything they had came from God. Everything they had came from God. Their good harvest, their plentiful livestock, everything they had. And they knew they had to give to Him first. That was the key. They had to give to God first. They didn't wait till winter was over and say, okay, God, yeah, as soon as we make it through the winter, anything that's left over come spring, now we're going to give that to you. Because who would that show that they're putting their faith in? God or stuff? things, okay? Most people, we do that. I've talked to so many people, they're like, man, I'd love to give, I'd love to do this or that, but, you know, I'll wait and see till the end of the month, and when we, if anything's left over, then, then we'll give. How much of you have anything left over? In fact, if you want to save up for a vacation, say you're saving up for a vacation or a new rifle or golf clubs or an expensive purse or a jacket or an article of clothing or, or, or whatever it is, if you're saving up for it, do you go, okay, I'm going to get to the end of the month and when the end of the month comes, then I'll see what's left and I'll put that aside. You know you ain't never going to get what it is you're, you're wanting because that's not how it works. In fact, most of you don't even save. You just buy it at the beginning of the month and then hope that everything works out at the end. Am I right? I know, I've done that before. I got in big trouble for doing that. <laughs> Molly, you bought a what? Oh, I'm in trouble. No, you don't. You put it aside first or you do it first, okay? Okay. That's why God says, give to me first. I gave it to you. Now, as an act of worship, an act of trust, give it first. Well, what if we're short at the end of the month? That's called a trust issue. And you may have to change your spending habits. You may have to sacrifice some things for God. But considering the fact, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, I think giving up a few coffees or a golf outing or something is probably not that big of a deal if you think about it. I ask you again the question what's this church worth to you well Bart I give my time and my talent I've heard that for years from people in the church I give my time and my talent but man my treasure you know but my time's worth a lot I mean I, I'm, I'm really talented so I give a lot of that, that that's worth a lot if you figure out all the time I spent I had a friend of mine that did that said man I've dollar cost you know how much time I spent at the church and you know what they say like meatloaf says Time, talent, treasure. I give time and talent. Two out of three ain't bad. Well, let me ask you this. You have a college class. You have three assignments over the course of the semester. Each one counts 33% of your grade. You only do two of them. What is your grade? 66, which is a D. And so he goes, I passed. Really? You passed with a D? You want to stand before God and say, at least I passed? Or you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Two out of three ain't bad. Now, I've had people say even here over the last few years, well, man, the church, looks, look at that. We got the building, got this property. You don't need my finances. I'm, I'm good. Well, let me tell you where we're at. Our basic operating budget is $52,000 a month, and that's basic. That's staff, building payment, insurance on building, liability, electricity, internet, cleaning, maintenance agreements like on the AC, office supplies, postage, and minimum budgets, i.e. minimum budgets, as in like Scott told you a few weeks ago. His budget is basically he has like $2 per head per kid per week to spend on those kids out there. That's just to get by. But there's a lot more than ministry than just keeping the lights on. 
And they go, well, a lot of stuff going around here. Well, you know, people, God keeps surprising us one-time gifts of stuff. One-time gifts of things. Last year, we, uh, one of the visions I had for this church when we started for, from the very beginning was to have what we call a rock pile. I envisioned like 12 stones, and, and then, you know, whenever you had something happen, you could take a stone and you could write on it, a day, a verse, or whatever, and you'd go set that stone on the rock pile as a stone of remembrance. And Scott started talking about how at churches he'd been at, they had a hope wall, like the wailing wall in Jerusalem where people write prayers and put on it. And me and him started talking, and we figured out, God just gave us a vision where we could combine the hope wall and the, and the rock pile remember wall into one thing. And we priced it out, and we started sharing, man, this is this great thing. Then anybody for it? Somebody heard it and paid for it. Somebody stepped up and paid for it. When we moved in, we needed a tractor. We didn't have funds for the budget for a tractor. Somebody said, what are we going to do? How are we going to keep with this property? And we need a tractor. They went out and bought a tractor and gave it to us. Okay? The pond out there, there was a hole in the ground that they used to put, dig dirt for the foundation. Saved us about a quarter million dollars on the, on the property, but we wound up with a hole. And then it filled up with water. And then the water leaked out. That wasn't going to look good. So somebody basically donated the money that it took to Benonite it so that it would hold water. And we have a pond. Me and Skip paid for the fish. <laughs> and I buy the fish food to throw out there because I love feeding my fish out there. Right? How many of you have seen the new sign out front? Okay, if you drove in and you ain't seen the new sign out front, why are you driving? You blind. <laughs> that electronic sign, an individual been coming to church here, he does that as a company. It's not finished yet. It'll be finished hopefully by next week. But he said, hey, man, Bart, I want to give you, I want to help provide a sign. I'm going to do it for half price. Half price was still more than most cars we drive. And I told him, I said, dude, we can't pull, there's no way, we cannot do this. He said, well, just take it. You know, like the guy gave me the proposal. I filed it. Three days later, somebody came up and said, hey, Bard, wouldn't it be cool if we had one of those electronic signs out front for messages or whatever? I said, yeah, ironically, I got that proposal. I said, but the cost is ridiculous. They said, well, send me a copy. Let me take a look at it. So I said, I made him a copy. I handed it to him. Three days later, they called me and drove up and handed me a check for it. So big projects around here are getting done. And all these people are people who they tithe. They tithe regularly. They tithe monthly. All these projects they've done have been above their normal giving. And that's amazing, y'all. That's amazing. Here's what you guys need to know, okay? We're talking about this, and we do this rarely. I mean, some of you have been around 12 years. You've made me heard, heard me talk about finances maybe five times in 12 years. For you visitors today, you might have just come at a wrong time. <laughs> but if you're visiting with us, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to our members and regular attenders, and you know this, but as a visitor, I am talking to you too. We're not after your money. We're after your heart. But here's the thing, y'all. We teach on finances and giving because giving is a heart attitude. It's an attitude of obedience. Giving is a heart issue. And I would be remiss if I got to heaven, stood before God, and he said, your people didn't give. They didn't have a heart of giving. Well, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about. Big boy, you got to talk about it. And I'd be remiss if I didn't. We, the church, need to move to a place of obedience and worship. Start giving our first fruits. More than just covering the monthly bills. So that we continue to help ministries like Casa Hogar, the orphanage, and Manzanilla. Is that right? Close? close. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> what he said. Clay just told me, I can't speak Spanish up here because I mangle it so bad. But we'd love to do more down there and help them. There is a camp in Costa Rica that Scott has talked to that we could go down there and help fix up. And it could be a camp not just for us, but for churches all in Central America and, and, and the U.S., right? We have pastors in Central America, South America, and this little this big island in the Caribbean where they like to roll cigars and, roll cigars and smoke cars. Wait, that didn't come out right. They drive in old cars and roll cigars. They want us to come and train pastors to plant churches. 
We want to plant like-minded churches here. Like Scott was We want to plant a like-minded church in Quero. There's a need in Quero. In Wimberley, where Scott came from. Carn City. Man, we found out Carn City Kennedy needs a church like this. There's people that are dying to have a church like this in some of these small towns. But it takes money to equipment, provide, to do stuff, to help them get off the ground. And I'm not talking about building a satellite campus, you know, that would be at first, but our goal is to actually find a, a, a pastor that has our DNA and a heart for the small town to go in and we assist them and we plant churches. We want to help people in need here in our church, in our community, do relief and development work around the world. I've done that for years. And like James says, you can't just tell people, hey, have a good life, be full, stay warm, take care, go with God. And you don't help meet their needs first before you tell them about Jesus. And that's what we want to do. We want to help people in our church. We want to help people in our community. I ask you again, what's this church worth to you? For me, let me tell you what it's worth. For the first few years here at the church, I didn't take a paycheck. I want to make sure that Skip, Cindy, other staff, everybody got paid. I didn't need to take the paycheck. Then I was told that, well, the IRS kind of looks at you really weird if you're doing this and you're not on the books somewhere. And so the accountants and lawyers said, you need to, you need to have a check. Said, not to mention, if something ever happened to you, then it's on the books and, you know, you have the money there to hire another pastor. So it helps with our retirement stuff. But I give 100% of my paycheck here at Fellowship of the Crossroads back to the church each month. 100%. And... And then I tithe on what I get off our ranch. That's how much y'all mean to me. That's how much this place means to me. Not just because y'all are an amazing church. Church isn't the building. The church is you. When I say we have an amazing church, I'm not talking about this building. I'm not talking about this property. I'm not talking about this campus. I'm talking about you. Y'all are incredible. And I'm a better person for having y'all in my life. My family's better for having y'all in our lives. And I do this because it's what God calls us to do. And because the more I do and the more I give, the more God can use to bless our family. I'm just a steward of it. I'm just a steward of what God's provided just like y'all are just stewards of what God's provided you. So I ask you one more time, what is this church worth to you? Do you have a marriage that's been saved or in the process of being saved because of this church? Did you learn how to be, have you learned since you've been here, how to be a better spouse, a better parent, a better neighbor, a better friend? Did you meet your spouse here? How many of your weddings have I done? Have you been going through the loss of a loved one? And this family came alongside, carried you through it. Has this church just with you and your loved ones up in prayer when you've been down? Were you living a life alone and you now found a community and a group to be part of? Uh, have you had some issue in your life and this church counseled you, helped you walk through it? Have you been struggling with addiction, alcohol, drugs, something else? And this church gotten you the help you need? Have you been rejected in other places, other churches? heard this place said come as you are decided to test it out and found out we meant it why do you think i wear these freaking holy boots every week people ask me why don't you get new shoes i said i want the, i want people to see that the pastor's wearing beat up old shoes because when i say come as you are i mean come as you are this is how i am this is how if you run into me during the week this is how you see me this is how i'm dressed i'm me I'm, I'm me on Sunday morning. I'm me when you run into me at HEB. I'm me when you wait on me at Long John Silver's. I got recognized by somebody getting chicken planks at Long John Silver's last night. They said, do I call you father or pastor? I'm like, father? <laughs> do you know something I don't? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you have kids that used to moan and complain about going to church and are now on Saturday night looking at you going, we're going to church tomorrow, right? Right? What's that worth to you? 
What's that worth to you? You found Jesus, we're born again in this place, and now you're going to spend eternity with him instead of a hell meant for the devil. What's that worth to you? What's that worth to you? The challenge today is this, real clearly. The challenge is this. Give your first fruits as God called you to give. That's the challenge today. I'm going to pray. The band's going to come up here and play. I'm going to give an opportunity to these cards. You filled it out. Now's the time when the band plays closing song here. Come, drop them in the buckets at the cross. Put your pledge, your commitment there. That's what we're going to do today. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. <clears throat> I thank you for this church. I thank you for this opportunity we have to meet every week. But most importantly, I thank you for the difference that you've made in so many of our lives. Because this place is a home. This place is family. I know there's so many people here that are like, this is the best hour of my week. And so, Father, we want to do what you've called us to do. As a church, we want to be good stewards of what you've provided us, remembering that it all came from you in the first place. It's not really ours to begin with. We're just taking care of your stuff, your talents, for as long as you'll have let us be here on this side of eternity. And so our goal is to give our first fruits of an act of worship and an act of trust, because that's what it is. But it's so easy for us to say, we trust you, you know? It's really easy to say, you trust somebody until they ask you for the keys to the car or to the house or take your daughter out. It's easy to use the word trust. And we can say trust, but the truth of the matter is, Father, you know our actions speak louder than our words. What are we doing with what you've given us? And so, Father, today, I thank you for the opportunity make these commitments to you, to give you our first fruits, to do the one thing you tell us to test you in, and that's give. That's give. The word basically says, don't jump off tall buildings, don't play in traffic. Don't do anything stupid and say that I'm going to protect you because that might not be my plan. But you do tell us to test you on giving make it clear we can't outgive you mainly because all we have to give is the time you've given us on this side of eternity the talents and gifts you've given each of us and the treasure that you've trusted us with we can't give out you because you're the one that bought the french fries today. Come for Lord you than activation. We celebrate on this Palm Sunday. Lay that yourself rode triumphantly in Jerusalem to go to the cross, to take our place, to cover our sins once and for all. So we worship you. And we praise you. going to have this afternoon being a family and celebrating the gift of your son Jesus Christ in name we pray amen